welcome to the 2013 Wall Street's Mayoral Forum. My name is Gordon Belford. My name is Gordon Belford, and I'm a volunteer with Seattle Neighborhood Greenways, which is hosting the forum, along with the Park Shore Retirement Community, with support from a long list of organizations, which I'm about to read, uh, the Madison Park Community Council, Bicycle Alliance of Washington, Feet First, 12th Ave Stewards, Senior Services, Seattle Parks Foundation, Seattle Bike Blog, Commute Seattle, Seattle Subway, FutureWise, BikeWorks, Sustainable Seattle, Capitol Hill Eco District, West Seattle Bicycle Connections, Safe Kids Seattle, and Cool Mom. Uh, the Great, great list of organizations, and we're all excited they're able to help out with this forum. Um, the intent of this forum is educational and partisan, and I need to note that what is said and asked tonight does not necessarily reflect the views of the hosting or supporting organizations, uh, and that this forum in no way indicates support from any of these organizations or to any of these candidates. And I will now ask you to please hold all applause until the end of the forum, except for what I'm about to introduce Tom and Deb. Um, on a lighter note, I hope tonight will be fun, informative, and useful for everyone involved. And without further ado, let me introduce Tom Fugloro and Deb Sauls. Um, Tom is a Central Seattle Greenways leader, a Central District resident, the former writer of Central District News, a prolific journalist, and the current writer of Seattle Bike Blog. Give him a round of applause. <laughs> And Deb is a Rainier Valley Greenways leader, Columbia City resident, and had a long career at the YMCA before becoming the director of Bike Works. Give it up a bit. So we are running a little behind to start us off right away with an icebreaker. So if we could just go down the line and in 30 seconds, state your name and your first memory of traveling someplace on your own. Did you say the first memory of what? I'm sorry, I didn't hear it. Your first memory of traveling someplace on your own. Oh. Okay. okay, this is a scary memory. My name is Bruce Harrell. I serve on the city council. Proud to be here. Bring me back a bad memory. My first time I was a student up here at TT Minor, and I lived in the Central District on 24th and Olive, and my first time I had to walk home by myself and I am directionally challenged. I've been here all my life, I even get lost in Seattle. And so I walked the way home, and I was a block from my home, and I had to walk all the way back to talk to the crossing guard, and my mother had to come and get me. <laughs> Thanks for bringing that up. So. Hi, I'm Kate Martin. The first thing I can remember, really feeling like I was going someplace on my own, uh, I went with a, was with a friend that felt like we were on our own. We were in middle school, I was in New Jersey where I was, grew up in a little bucolic suburb and we took the train, the two of us, into New York City and I spent the only money I had on a piece of cheesecake for my mom because I thought she'd be really happy and when I got off the train, I stumbled and I dropped the cheesecake. <laughs> okay, well, for me it would be similar to Bruce's. It's walking from Alki Elementary School to 61st Street. Um, uh, kindergarten. Uh, first time I remember going traveling on my own, and uh, it was a walkable community. You could walk back and forth to school. The first thing that popped into my mind, oh, first of all, I'm Joey Gray, and I remember when we were kids growing up in Lacey, Washington, right outside of Olympia, we would get on our bikes and go on epic day-long bike rides, and then it would get to be dusk, and we would be so far away from home, and our parents would have to come pick us up with the truck, and we'd pile our bikes in the back of the truck to get home. And thanks for this question, because it brings back so many wonderful memories, certainly to, to me. And I grew up in Mount Baker, and my first memory is uh, four years old, and about two blocks away where Mount uh, Baker Community uh, Center sits now was a place called McNamara Drugs. And above McNamara Drugs was Bob the Barber. And at four years old, I walked down by myself and I had these pretty 
curls in those days, blonde curls, and I got my first haircut all alone without my mother's knowledge. Well, when I returned that evening, I really got my mother's knowledge and she laid into me and I've never forgotten it and thanks for letting me relive that. Good evening, everyone. I'm Mary Martin. I'm the Socialist Workers Party candidate for mayor. I spent three years on um, Raymi Air Force Base in Puerto Rico where my dad was stationed growing up. And for reasons I don't exactly remember, one day I was walking home alone um, instead of being picked up as was the usual thing. And a friend of the family picked me up who was Puerto Rican. And he had Puerto Rican flags on the seat and instead of hanging from the mirror. And he explained to me this is because if you're for independence in Puerto Rico at that time, it was a dangerous thing to have a Puerto Rican flag hanging uh, because of the oppression of Puerto Rican nationalists, who to this day, there are Puerto Rican nationalists in jail. And one of the things we call for is free Oscar Lopez. I, uh, I, think, I think the earliest memory I have is walking to kindergarten, and, and we did that. Um, and we collected kids on the way up the block um, with the way it worked. Uh, Johnny Friedland was always just waiting by his door right when we walked by. We never had to knock. I'm on the far left here once again. Peter Stein worked for uh, Seattle Mayor. Uh, my earliest memory, in fact, this auditorium, I have not been here for over 40 years. One of my earliest memories of travel was my little red bike with one training wheel on it coming here to kindergarten or first grade, I can't remember, because this is my elementary school. Harrison Elementary, later to become Martin Luther King Head Start program. Uh, I got a swatter tooth from Dorothy McKinney, who was the principal during my early years. Uh, I think I rode on the walls or something. But I remember the proud feeling of being having a safe route to school before even anybody thought about that before it was even an idea, but it was safe at the time. We need to get back to that time and that place when kids can ride their bikes to school on their own, feel proud and confident and safe. Thank you. Yeah, you can clap, it's fine. <laughs> okay, for the first section of questions that we have, um, we call these major questions, uh, you will have uh, one minute and 30 seconds to answer them, and we have, uh, we're short on time, so we're going to be pretty strict about that. Um, you'll, you'll hold up time card to say a minute left, 30 seconds left, 10 seconds left, and then stop. Um, and we'll just get right down to it. So the other part for the candidates, please refrain from speaking when it's not your turn. For the audience, if you can be respectful and allow the candidates to um, say their, what they have to say. Um, and that is all that needs to be said. So, the first question. Okay, think of a friend who has a third grade child. Imagine that friend is not comfortable letting their child walk her bike to school. What specifically will you do during your term as mayor to make it safe for that child and all Seattle children to walk or bike to school? And perhaps we can start with Peter this time. Sure, just Well, this is, children uh, as well as seniors, I think, are our indicator species in terms of uh, safety on the streets. And we are not a civil city, we are not a civil society until our streets are safe for all. For all modes of travel, bike, pet. Pet is the earliest form of, that there is, the oldest, the most important and ancient. And we all, most of us do walk. And so that should be priority number one, is to make the streets safe for walking for all ages, especially children of early age, uh, and I think for seniors, because our population is increasingly becoming heavy on the senior side and heavy on the younger side. And that's a good thing. So safe routes to school is something we should all, uh, I think, take to heart and walk the talk. There are ways that we can improve our safe routes. We can have pathways that don't even rely on crossing streets. Uh, pathways through neighborhood east, uh, neighbor easements. 
new properties. This is something that New England has done for centuries. I see it out in places like Crown Hill and other parts of the city where you actually have pathways that cut through private property. As a kid, that's what I always did. We all did that. We cut through, who cares about the legalities? You don't think about those things. But that's just an aside. But I think that there's some practical reality to that, that there are many ways to, to find your way through the city. And certainly the unprotected intersections in our city that somehow the transportation gurus of the world have decided that if they put crossings there, that they are making them less safe. I had to fight for years to get a crossing just in my own former neighborhood of Pinehurst out northeast so that I could push my kids' strollers across the street where there are no, no Stop controlled me. intersections. <laughs> All right, thank you. Thank you. We're going to be tough. Thanks. Um, you know, I moved, when I moved to the neighborhood of Greenwood, is 87th Street, just north of the old city line, and walking with my kid to the Safeway two blocks away was, was dangerous because without sidewalks, cars park on the very edge of the right of way, and the moving cars, two lanes, the cars go really fast, and you have to walk between the parked cars and the moving cars. And so I actually really got uh, focused on how do we get some sidewalks into our neighborhood. We worked hard on that, and we got eight block faces put in and, and worked on trying to get more funding. It's one of the things that motivated me to get involved with the Bridging the Gap oversight at, at the time, the campaign to get it on the ballot, get more money for the Neighborhood Street Fund, um, and, and help work on getting that passed. In fact, one thing led to another, and I helped, before I become mayor, pass complete streets legislation. Every time you rebuild a street, you make it safer for walking, biking, transit, all users so as to make it safer, which is really great. We're the second city in the state after Kirkland to do it. Um, when I became mayor, I really wanted to add a lot more money. The city council had just got rid of the head tax, which was four and a half million for it. Um, and you know, we've, we've worked to add more money for it. Here's what, here's what we need. I was mentioning dollars, because we need dollars for the improvements. But safe routes to school are a combination of sidewalks, safer places to cross arterials, um, neighborhood greenways, which are prioritizing residential streets and safe crossings as well. We put up speed cameras outside of four schools. We're going to keep expanding to more. All of the dollars we raise from those safety cameras, we are going to put directly into safe routes to schools. Thank you. There was an article in the Seattle Times last week that said the number of children in Washington State in poverty has grown by 3% to 18%, and that 33% of the parents of those children are unemployed or underemployed. So you can talk about making it safe for children to walk to streets, but what about making it possible for children to have food, medical care, security in their lives, for parents to have jobs? I mean, that's the real safety for children, to have a house where the parents are working to have food, to have access to medical care. I think it's too narrow to talk about getting to school when they could get to school and not have had breakfast. They could get home to a place that doesn't have fans or, or heat in the winter, uh, and where there's no groceries in the house. So that's what I'd like to raise on this point. Thank you. Well, for me, it would be certainly creating fun and innovative pathways, whether they be walkways, whether they be bikeways. And to enhance that um, with really important wayfaring that is wayfaring not only for the people traveling, but for cars uh, going the opposite way and making sure they are aware that these bikeways and walkways exist. It has to be fun and it has to be safe. So use of LED lights, for example, on crosswalks, or even having artists in your neighborhood paint crosswalks. They don't have to be white stripes on black pavement. They can be willoughbys going across the, the savannah. And kids will then use them and likewise, Motorists will take notice of those. Police, obviously, if you are not 
concerned, if you are concerned about the safety of your child, police are a part of that, neighborhood police. Police, ideally, that live in your neighborhood and that you know on a first name basis. Um, encourage schools to maintain their staffing of crossing guards. And if they run out of money, look to the neighborhoods, look to parents, look to seniors. Another key is just basically educating our children on what is safe. So when I look at the statistics, crossing in the middle of the block causes 80% of the injuries. Thank you. Bicycling is one of my top priorities. Those of you who know me in this audience, I've been a serious bicycle advocate very recently for, for two or three years, very, very seriously, and all my life I've, I've advocated for bike paths and bike trails. And I, as an executive, would be very tempted to focus on this issue as much as you all do, but what I would do instead as an executive in the executive role would be to focus on safe routes to school research that's already been done. I would leave it up to you. I would enable you as an information systems consultant. I would build and integrate systems throughout our city that tie city infrastructure to all the work and the innovation and the ideas that you guys are doing already and facilitate that. And just as an example, this is at the University of Washington. I was in student services for 10 years and I, right when laptops were coming out, facilitated between the athletic department, undergraduate libraries, computing and communications, and a couple other departments, a brand new program that became distance learning for the whole University of Washington. My informal title was the glue. And that's the role that I would take because I don't think an executive should presume to know more about this issue than you guys. Thank you. Well, thank you, and thank you all for putting this forum together and all the organizations that put it together. You know, some of you, we worked together a few years ago um, to actually get the state to restore some of the pet and bike money that had gone away as a result of Tim Lyman. Uh, we worked together to create, at the state level, safe routes to schools and to fund it. Um, and so, I, when I look at the issue of walking to school or biking to school, I look at programs expanding safe routes to school. I think the next city uh, bridge in the gap should emphasize that. I think we should work with local neighborhood. Each school and each neighborhood is different and identify the solutions that will work in that area, whether it's chicanes uh, or you know, sidewalks with larger balls uh, as you cross. There's various methods of traffic calming. Uh, but I think, first of all, uh, there's a lot more that can be done with bridging the gap uh, the next time it comes up for um, a vote. Um, I'd also say, uh, Years ago, when I worked at the city council, the first thing I worked on was the idea of chicanes in Finney Ridge, which was a brand new idea um, that was tried and, uh, and worked and slowed down the traffic. So there are real concrete ways uh, through programs like Safe Routes to School and Bridging the Gap that we can fund and expand what we've built on. Thank you. Yes, so I don't have to think that far back when I had children that age and how terrorizing it was for them to try and get around. Luckily, they went to bike works, learned how to ride on the street, but it was very terrorizing. Um, I've been an advocate for sidewalks um, for about the last 20 years as an activist. I've also worked on the Greenways movement in my neighborhood with Robin Randalls. So I'm completely behind the Greenways movement. I'd like to note that our current mayor is still on the 400-year plan for sidewalks, just like the mayor before him and the mayor before him. So I have a plan for sidewalks. It's a 10-year plan, and we're going to get it done, and we're not going to pass the buck. Also, I'm going to put money from the general fund into maintaining sidewalks. Our current mayor has only put $18,000 from the general fund into sidewalk maintenance last year for the entire city which is about enough money to improve the conditions in front of about two storefronts. The city is responsible for the maintenance of sidewalks 
any place where they've put a street tree in. So I think they should step up and take responsibility. I will allow the citizens to petition to lower their speed limits on their street to the legal limit so that we can have less terrorizing neighborhoods. I will enforce failure to yield with a moving violation, not a robo ticket. Something that really goes on your record and hurts. I think that's what's going to slow people down. I think that's what's going to get them to stop. So there's a little taste of where I'm headed as mayor. Thank you so much. Thank you. I'll just remind everybody what the question is about making a third grade child who's not comfortable with uh, walking or biking to school, how would we encourage that? The first thing is, uh, we have to look at what's happened to our city. Uh, about 40 years ago, uh, close to 41, 42% of the of, of kids uh, lived around their school within a mile, and almost 90% walked or biked. Now, only about 13% do. So first thing, of course, we have to have something to walk to a great school, and that's why you hear me on my Kenneth, you talking a lot about enriching our great schools. The first, uh, thank you, I forgot to talk about it. The first piece, the second piece would be uh, why we wouldn't encourage safety, and I think we've heard some great ideas uh, uh, traffic uh, synchronization, making sure lightage, uh, lighting is, is appropriate, crossing guard, just coordinating coordinate with the school district. I've done a lot of work in that regard as public safety chair looking at emergency responses in terms of some of the craziness we've seen. So I'm in contact with the school district about making sure everything is safe. The third piece I would say is we can't do it without you. So we have to then make sure that parents can help coordinate the walking strategy. It's sort of like a snowball. Maybe another parent or another two parents can help and we can pick up kids along the way, make it a very enjoyable experience. Again, we want to promote health. We want to promote uh, sort of a collegial spirit in the city. So under my leadership, we'll have what I'll call walking parties. And so you'll see several kids walking together with very uh, energetic parents. Uh, the last thing I say in 10 seconds is, our, I will create community service officers, CSOs throughout the city. They will be in the police department, but they will be there for you to help you with the walking. Thank you. Great. So I think with this one, we'll start with the mayor, the current mayor. Oh, yeah, you did. Oh. The first one. First one, first one. Yeah. So this next one, we'll start with the mayor again and work this way then to the round. Okay, so, so the second question. Imagine you are 85 years old and looking back at your tenure as mayor. How did the policies and priorities that you implemented while you were mayor make it easier for you to age gracefully and get around safely in your neighborhood? So that would be 32 years from now, if I make it to 85. And boy, 32 years from now, I really hope we see just an absolute transformation of the city. Um, and so I was president of my community council for years. And that was where I first became really clear to me how important it was to have walkable streets, good transit system, mix of uses nearby, you know, so it enables someone who's a senior to age in their, in their neighborhood with everything they need nearby or a bus ride away. Um, and a lot of seniors were engaged with our neighborhood planning and that was one of their highest priorities because it gave them autonomy and freedom. And, and so that's always, and I joke about it with my wife, every time I had moved, I had always brought my speaker boxes with me Right, so the next time we moved, I could pack up the speakers and take them somewhere. And then after the neighborhood planning, she saw me throwing out the speaker boxes and realized we were never moving anywhere. Because in Greenwood, we had all of the building blocks for that great neighborhood and a nice little house. I would love to see in 30 years, not just for aging gracefully in place, but for dealing with the health epidemic we're seeing and for dealing with climate change, I would love to see that everybody can have as their first choice walking, biking, and transit. That just should be their first choice, absolutely. We're going to need it 30 years from now, um, just for economic reasons, health reasons, environmental reasons. And the vitality of neighborhoods when you build those places is really clear. Those are the best places to be. It's where you want to be, so this is what we should try to do. Thank you. Well, as is no surprise to anyone, the capitalist system is in a pretty deep crisis. And the framework of this crisis, from the point of view of the capitalist politicians, whether Democrats or Republicans, is that we, the working class, should pay for this crisis. So the future is not looking good for seniors, for veterans, 
for working people and for young people today who come out of school with massive debt and, and, and few job prospects, you know, depending on, on the class that they're from. This is why we call for a massive public, federally funded jobs program to put millions of people to work, building things we need, roads, schools, bridges, community centers, art centers. We say defend a woman's right to choose abortion, no restrictions, decriminalize the status of undocumented workers, we need to unify and organize all workers, and free the Cuban Five political prisoners. In this, in, in this period, we're not on the eve of a revolution in this country, although I believe that's the only way we'll have lasting change in a government that defends our interests, the working class, not those of the wealthy billionaire ruling class. But we can use this time to organize and unify to fight for the things that working people need. You know, all of us will stand up here tonight and make one of these wonderful promises of, yes, I would love to fund that. And we're going to have sidewalks up north, and we're going to have bikeways, but it takes money. And it takes, you have a limited budget. So as mayor, you have to do two things, in my opinion. You have to prioritize, and that can get very tough at times. And it's not about silos, it's about working together. But where it says to me, where would I be most proud? And unlike my mayor, I have to work a little faster than he does to make this happen. <laughs> um, to me, it is about expanding the tax base of our city so we can afford these things. How do we expand that tax base? Through trade, through tourism, through job creation to creating, to, to narrowing the skills gap so that our very children can work in the jobs that are going to be created in Seattle. Well, we are, we, we can't even imagine the things that are going to be developed here. Thought here, developed here, and I hope made here. But it's that broad continuum of getting people to work so the virtuous cycle that they can create an income for their families and create a tax base and that all these wonderful programs you take off the shelf and you can fund because you've expanded the base. That's what I'd be most proud of. Thank you. The world is already experiencing the effects of climate change and 40 years from now, I can't even begin to imagine what our city and what our world will look like if we don't take extreme action as soon as possible to get ourselves off of fossil fuel. And everything that you guys are doing is pushing that, and we all need to help each other push it further and faster. Every refinery in Washington State takes tar sands oil right now, and I don't own a car because I don't want to put that stuff, I don't want to be dependent on that stuff. And I want to make it easier and easier for more people to stop doing that. So. Uh, who here is from Park Shore, by the way? Anybody? I spent a lot of time with my grandparents there for 20 years, so I'm glad you could make it. And I just think about whether or not it would even be possible for me to afford to live there, and I don't think it, it is because our economy is so different now than it was during, as they were earning to be able to live there. So I have many fond memories, and I think about how hard it was for them to get around. And I would especially combine resources in this city, work together with businesses, public institutions, uh, private people and private enterprise, just to get people to use all of our buses and all of our resources to help get people around. I would do even more about the ADA. That's one of my favorite laws in the world is the Americans with Disabilities Act because it's been so great for us as a cyclist as well. And my time is up. There's a lot more I would do. Thank you. Thank you. Well, um, 85, from third grade to 85, wow. Um, uh, a couple of years ago, in my 50s, walking on the sidewalk, walking my dog, uh, I tripped and fell in, uh, on a broken sidewalk and tore my rotator cuff. Uh, I hadn't had anything to drink. Um, but it was, uh, it was an eye-opener to me about just the 
conditions of our sidewalks and streets. Over the last four years, our major backlog of our crumbling infrastructure has grown to $2 billion. So you've heard some things here that I think are very, very correct. First of all, we did, do, we did pass the uh, bridge the gap, um, but the general fund part of transportation has shrunk. Uh, we can't do the things we want to do for, to build those denser communities or to enhance our traditional neighborhoods uh, unless we can afford it. And we got to, the second thing we have to do if we're going to do another bridge the gap is we have to prioritize this, as uh, you just heard from one of the other speakers. Currently we have a transit plan, but we don't prioritize it. Currently we have a transportation plan, but we don't prioritize it. And we don't identify how we're going to pay for it. So yes, all of us up here, all of us up here, when we're 85, want to be able to walk uh, to wherever we want to go. We want to get on a bus so we don't have to climb up the stairs like you do in the number 49. Um, but we are going to have to make some decisions around funding, and that includes the general fund and not draining it off, and around prioritization. What are we going to do first? Other cities have done this, Vancouver, British Columbia, uh, prioritize. Their first priority was pedestrians. Thank you, sorry, actually, thank you. Hoping things are going to be better when I'm 85 is not going to get it done, and that's why I have a plan, because I'm a planner. So I served on the pedestrian master plan advisory group, and somehow we weaseled out of that without a plan for completing the sidewalks network in Seattle, which is really sad, because we're actually sending a bunch of old people, handicapped people, and disabled people to reservations out in the far extremities of Lesser Seattle, where they can't even leave their buildings. So I did a study in Greenwood a couple of years ago called Greenwood Streetscapes. And I worked with many blocks with workshops to figure out how we're going to get these sidewalks done. And this is what I came up with. If the city leverages the private property investment, we can get it done. 95% of all sidewalks in Seattle were paid for by the landowners. So I want to continue that tradition, but I want to add a carrot to the program. What I want to do is have the city engineer and install the intersections, which are the most important and, com and, and complicated parts of the project, and then have the landowners connect the dots with the sidewalks and the rain gardens in every block. So as soon as there's a couple blocks ready, we'll do the intersections. As soon as there's a couple more blocks ready, we'll do the intersections. I'm absolutely certain that in under 20 years, we can finish the sidewalk network in Seattle. And that way, all people will be able to leave their homes, get healthy exercise, which not only helps their body, but their brain. And that's what I want to look back and say I accomplish. Thank you. Thank you. You know, on these transportation issues, it becomes in Seattle such a polarizing debate. I think that's sort of part of the problem. I think many of us have described the problem. Um, we're spending about $12 million a year in the Bridging the Gap Fund, and about $2 million on the sidewalk repair. I think someone said they're right that this pace will take us about 500 years to repair all the sidewalks. Um, every, uh, every week, several times a week, I take my mother, uh, who lives with me on a walk, and the first thing I do is I make sure those sidewalks are very safe because they're not safe. And in some cases, it could be a fatal accident. So, under my leadership, number one, I want to focus on the basics. And number two, we have to come up with a stable funding source. The SDOT will say that uh, it'll take about $15 million and they want a, uh, a, a, a dedicated funding source. We have to look at a vehicle license fee. You may recall it failed at $60, but we have to sell it. We have to sell it to the voters. And if you look at the numbers, for example, $40 lower fee, $40 in eight years can generate $108 million. So we have to have the kind of leader, I think, that less polarizing the debate. And I'm not blaming McGinn or any of them. We're all part of an ecosystem here. But as leaders, we have to sub. And that would be a funding source that I would take a strong look at. The other piece I'd say is that the experience 30 years from now uh, needs to be safe as well. I refuse to believe, as an example, we have to have gangs in Seattle. That's not a way of life. I grew up on the streets out here. And in another forum, you'll hear me talk a lot about my plan to make sure that we eliminate gangs in Seattle. So. Thank you. Mr. Steinberg? Yes. And sorry, I do remember the question. <laughs> uh, 
what would give me the most sense of reward and um, accomplishment would be to, to eliminate the 10 to 15 lives that are lost every year in Seattle pedestrian and bicycle deaths as a result of extremely unsafe road and arterial conditions in the city. If I could do that one thing, I would um, sleep better at night and I would, I, I would feel like I'd accomplished something. Now how do we do that? I think greenways are the answer. I think this, uh, to me, this concept, which is relatively new to our city and new elsewhere in the country, but emerging as the most important and significant new way of thinking about how we utilize our streets and roads, complete streets, but taking it to another level. I would like to see, as part of my legacy, all 97 neighborhoods in the city have at least access to a safe greenway that is ecological, that is a street for all, that is for families, for children, for youth, for seniors. My own mother-in-law was tragically killed at a crossing uh, at a busy arterial a few years ago. This is the most important thing for us to be addressing, and I think Greenways at least provides part of the answer. Completes the streets. I passed the city's first ordinance on law requiring that streets be designed for all modes. It is now a national model. Uh, that's just one example. Thank you. Okay, thank you, everybody. We're going to move on to our next section, which is the lightning round. Um, all the questions except for this first one, uh, you'll need your big drawing pad. So if you want to, I know you all just got organized, but <laughs> you have to move your stuff around. Um, so during this round, each candidate will have a large drawing pad and pen. Uh, you need to write really big and hopefully only use a handful of words at most. One word would be great, um, if possible. Um, and then Deb's going to introduce the very first question, which is a little different. So this first question, we're going to give you $100 in Monopoly money. And you can spend your $100 for road repair, sidewalks, bike lanes, or more metro bus service. And so if you want to divide up your $100, how you would see it spent, you can write it down on your big flip chart, and we'll have everyone show them in about 30 seconds. Yes, I'll read the sections again. The $100 can be spent for road repair, sidewalks, bike lanes, or more, or more metro bus service. Road repair, sidewalks, bike lanes, bus service. Okay, so I started off with new sidewalks, which, by the way, would include the drainage system. We have to understand that that's a part of when you do curbing and sidewalks. Twenty dollars. Street trees. Uh, you know, I love the greenery. Five, five dollars. Signals uh, in critical uh, intersections around dangerous crossings. Fifteen dollars. Bike lanes. Fifteen dollars. And metro transit. Twenty. I also wanted to say that on the uh, new sidewalks and the new sidewalks. I'm sorry. Wait a minute. I don't have street repair. <laughs> Road repair is twenty-five dollars. Sorry about that. Road repair, R R twenty-five. That's my biggest ticket. I had to tell me I had twenty-five dollars to spare. So road repair, and that is for uh, bikes and cars and Vespas and scooters and everything else you wanted. But road repair is there. That's why that was my highest ticket. on road repair. Great, thank you. Okay. 
<laughs> so I put thirty dollars into road repair. I, I participated in the dike march on Saturday night and then in the gay pride parade yesterday and the condition of the road when you're actually walking on Broadway was so ridiculous. So let's get that done. Sidewalks with my plan for sidewalks. If I invest $35 at the city's end, I can leverage that um, to $150 with the private investment. So that's kind of how I'm thinking. Let's leverage, let's get more done, let's motivate people to really pay, pay for their sidewalks in front of their homes, which I learned from my study they're willing to do. I got $10 in for bike lanes, and I've got $25 in for Metro because I'm doing Metro with my campaign. And I can't tell you how miserable it is to go from one end of the city to the other on Metro. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, um, since my pension membership is so bad, I won't even hold it up. Um, so road repairs would be 35, bike lanes would be 15, Metro would be 20, and sidewalks would be 20, if my math is correct. Thank you. I chose to put road repair and bike lanes together because I have broken two bike rims on potholes. So I know there's different things, but in terms of biking around in the city, we're not going to hope it would be nice if we could get everywhere by a completely separate bike infrastructure, but that won't happen in the next four years. I wish it would. Um, and 25 for bus and 20 for sidewalks. Thank you. Uh, roads, and, uh, roads and signals 35, sidewalks 25, bike lanes 15, bus 25. Thank you. Well, I disagree with the framework of this question. See how they get me? Can you use the mic? It will go. I disagree with the framework of this question. See what they do to you? There's only so much money. It's a limited pie. There's $5 for health care and there's $5 for roads. I call for a massive public jobs program to build all the things that workers need. But this is going to be a fight. This is not a matter of signing a bill because the framework of capitalism is not to give working people what we need and not to start with human needs. Thank you. Can I have her other dollars in? <laughs> Stop wasting money on new highways and we'll have real money, not monopoly money. And I'm serious about this. We put so much more money into massive new highway projects and we do, we do try to figure out how to work with the rest of it. I'll say this, since taking office, we have increased our general fund support across all categories in the midst of deep recession. Um, that includes, we've put more dollars into basic road maintenance, into metro, into bike lanes, into neighborhood improvements. We'll keep doing it. We need more help from the state. They wouldn't give us more authority. They held more funding authority for the city hostage to new highways. Olympia failed us again. Thank you. Well, I got my money here, too. Mine was off. And I would agree, the first thing we need to do is work with the with the state because we cannot possibly fund all of our transportation needs in this city. The backlog of unfunded maintenance, the bridges, the roads, the potholes, and the improvements that we know we need for the 21st century to support hundreds of thousands of new workers and people living in Seattle. So I would work across the line bipartisan to build a stronger coalition to support a transportation package. Let's finally get on with it that this state and all of our growing communities need. That is number one. So Thank there was more money in the pot, and then 60% goes to roads and maintenance basic, but we include pedestrian and, tram and, and, and bicycle safety in that uh, Time. approach. And Time is up. I'll save the rest for later. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, first real lightning round question, so you need your pad for this one. So try to, um, 15 seconds to write your answers, and then just Hold them up so everyone can see them. Hold it over her Seattle channel. <clears throat> the percentage of Seattle residents who walk, bike, or take transit is growing year over year. Vancouver, BC has set an ambitious goal to have their residents make 50% of all trips in the city by walking, biking, or transit by the year 2020. As mayor, what percentage would you work to achieve by the end of your term?
I need to redo this. <laughs> <laughs> so I think choosing an artificial number is, is, is you know, I can say, hey, let's do what Vancouver does. Uh, that's, that's unrealistic. So I said, let's work on a metric system. Let's measure ourselves. Let's have a measurement year by year, a goal that we establish based on real data uh, and move forward that way. You all get to these comments? Sorry, you, that's your only freebie. The rest have to be legible. <laughs> you lose the second grade handwriting teacher endorsement this morning. Okay, this is the last one in the lightning round. 
Would you support a new levy in 2015 that includes significantly more funding for the bike and pedestrian master plans? Would you support a new levy in 2015 that includes significantly more funding for the bike and pedestrian master plans? You mean, are you talking about bridging the gap yes. levy? So, putting yes. more bridging the gap will expire in 2015. We actually have budgeted, budgeted in here a two minute stretch break. So if everyone wants to kind of do that. Questions are meant to be fun and non-controversial, and as such time for discussion or rebuttal will not be allowed. So, one minute, and um, read if you can read your, we'll draw the report. When the 1.5 million people in King County go to register their cars, I'd ask them to pay $100. And I'd immediately hand them an Orca card loaded with $100. So my programs are all about carrots. So that would make things a lot more pleasant for people if we actually had great bus service citywide. As I said, at riding Metro, with my campaign, has been very eye-opening. Fuel prices are why I don't ride, uh, why I don't drive for my campaign. Um, a bike network that doesn't safely connect people to the... So my, yeah, the, um, the best travel option for everyday people to get around today is, um, is very difficult. Walking, we have over a thousand miles of street edge with no sidewalks. And it's been that way ever since we annexed those areas 54 years ago. That's why I made a plan, so I'm going to stop that. Um, there's so many people that can't even walk to say, what is the best option? It depends on which part of South Seattle you live in. Thank you. The North End and the South End have no place to walk. Thank you. Moving down the line. <clears throat> on a beautiful summer day like this, what Seattle commercial area is your favorite place for just sitting outside, and what makes it pleasant? So, probably because it's easy for me to take the 49 bus from one end of Capitol Hill to the next, it would be the Pike Pine Corridor, sitting out someplace like the Odd Fellows Cafe, because uh, it's walkable, there's a variety of things to do, there's a park nearby, and then I can walk home. I do that less. Thank you. What is, your, what is your definition of a network of safe and healthy streets? A network of safe and healthy streets is Seattle Neighborhood Greenways. 
That's cheating. <laughs> Did you play in the street when you were growing up? At what age were you first allowed to walk to your friend's house? And ideally, should a street be used by children for play? First part, um, yes, I did play in the street. I was, um, I think I started at six to probably the age of 15. Um, should people, should children play in the street? Now that can get tricky um, if the street is closed off, if it is protected. Um, the Seattle of today is not the Seattle of my youth and we need to be conscientious of that. We travel differently, we, um, we travel faster, we text, we're more, we're more um, we lack the concentration that the older generation took driving very seriously. Now, it's very commonplace to drive. So, would I allow children to play on the street? Yes, if it was closed off by barricades and we had block parties, which I would strongly urge, Otherwise, be careful. Next question. Do you believe our major transit stations can be seamlessly and safely connected to our walking and bicycle network? See, I don't think that's the question facing working people in Seattle or Kent or Renton or Vancouver, Portland. Uh, in all the places where workers are locked out, like the ILWU workers in Portland and Vancouver, the workers on strike in Auburn and Belshaw, Adamatic, I think what's facing the working class is how to unify and organize, how to defend our unions, how to have jobs, how to raise the standard of living in this crisis of capitalism in which everything's going the opposite way. Next question. What is your definition of a green city? Oh. <laughs> wow. Wow, what a great question. You know, I look at the uh, Bullet Foundation building, and imagine if we had a whole city that way, right? That the energy that powered the city came from the sunlight that hit it, that all of the water that hit us was naturally infiltrated, that we could uh, get off of fossil fuels, that we could figure out how to you know, that would be walking, biking, transit, as, as electrified transit as good ways to get around. Um, it would be um, fabulous to, I mean, we're at something like 60%, close to 60% recycling now, but even going upstream further and starting to figure out the products we get, how we could make sure that they were, that they were greener. And of course, lots of living things are in that green. There should be great, you know, trees and parks and, and be connected that way as well. And it would be really nice if we, if our runoff into Puget Sound was all naturally clean before it got there. Thank you. Next question. Do you think of streets more as places for people or places for vehicles? Well, I sure like the last question. There's a lot more to the answer than that greening of our cities. However, streets are Open space, streets comprise 27% of our land area in the city, so it's a very important preserved open space, and it's a right-of-way, it's where we connect, and it's where mobility happens, it's where we meet people, it's, it's yes, where we play, where we recreate for some of us, and yes, our streets are used for all modes and should be. Uh, my basic premise is that pets, bikes, transit, Vehicles in that order ought to be prioritized uh, for the use of our streets. They can also be ecological in terms of services to address the fact that 25% of our city lacks storm drainage, both north and south, and we're discharging toxic pollutants into Puget Sound and our rivers and waters and watersheds. So we can use the streets for eco-services as well as for all those other things. So yes, I see streets as multifunctional. Streets of the future need to be more that way. Thank you. All right, last question in this round. Give me a, give me a lay down like the mayor got. <laughs> <laughs> Where do you like to walk in Seattle and why? That's a lay down. I love uh, walking in 918 along 
the Lake Washington Boulevard around the Mount Baker area going south. And, and I gotta say, uh, Green Lake's a close second. And, and the reason why is you get every person, it doesn't cost anything to walk, so you get different socioeconomic levels, different people, it's, it's vibrant, it could be windy, it could be raining, people walk, they get the cardio in. So uh, I find that very, very relaxing and very, uh, very fun. And it's a good group of folks. I think I know, I probably know 30 people that take that walk all the time as well. Great, thank you very much, all of you. So now we, uh, we're turning back into the major questions. So these are, you'll have uh, one and a half minutes to answer this question. And um, where should we start? Do we start with Joey yet? We'll start with Joey, and then move this way. <laughs> Towards us. Towards Bruce. All right. We all love living, working, and playing in Seattle. But when we visit other cities, we're often inspired by new ideas. What other city have you visited that has a culture of walkable, bikeable, livable neighborhoods that inspires you? And what ideas or policies would you like to see implemented from that city that you think would make Seattle more livable? This is my favorite question because I've lived in four countries. I was an exchange student in Switzerland when I was 17 and that shaped my, my adulthood in realizing that I wasn't dependent on a car. They have the most amazing network of every kind of train, gondola, bus, ski lift that you can imagine. And my school there was a teacher's college and the, the entrance was a huge awning with enough bike parking for the entire school and everybody would go then into a foyer area as, as big as this room that was set up for each class and they would change and hang up all their wet clothes and have slippers that they would wear around the school and it was like this, you would just leave your stuff and they didn't have to have lockers and then you'd go to school and, and it was like seamless. You could go straight from biking into the, the building was integrated into the transportation network. So I've also um, seen the bike lifts in Norway. I think that there could be some use for that here up our hills. Um, the, the bike parking garages in Asia are a great innovation. We could, once we have more and more bikers, especially downtown, we could do those. And they, now we have new, new development in South Lake Union that doesn't even have a bike parking at all. And I'm looking around for uh, electrical pole holders to put my bike against. So I think we have a long ways to go there. Um, I was I led a, a delegation to Kaohsiung City, one of Seattle's sister cities in Taiwan, Hi. and. They have an amazing network. Thank you. And I just want to let all the candidates know that um, after, after this question, we'll have uh, closing statements. Well, there's, there's several examples that come to mind. I mean, one, of course, is Amsterdam with its incredible bike culture, with its ability to you know, both use water and pedestrian. But of course, Amsterdam is flat, and we are not. But there are ideas that could be incorporated there. Barcelona with cycle tracks. Uh, with an incredible um, transit system uh, that connects to an incredible rail system so you don't even need to use a car uh, when you want to leave the city. Um, uh, Dublin, which has this incredible street called Grafton Street that actually is a pedestrian street with shops on it. It works. We haven't been able to do that very well here. Uh, and finally, I wanted to say a bit about um, uh, the state transportation package. You know, we all voted, um, you, we in Seattle voted 75, 80% for a package we put together that restored pedestrian, that restored transit money, that had money for safety, taking down things like the viaduct. We came together on that package. We lost several years before we were able to win, but we came together on that package. What we just heard here was a governor, a mayor attacking Olympia. You know why we won? You know why we won that package? Because we worked with Olympia. We didn't attack Olympia. We have to build partnerships with Olympia. And we're not done, and the governor's not done either. So I, I wouldn't write off Governor Inslee like you write, wrote off the last governor. I think we have a real opportunity still to move forward in this state on our transportation system, just like we did in 05 when we voted 80% after John Carlson put that package on the uh, ballot. Thank you. I know this sounds really crazy, but I'm going to bring up New Jersey again. The town I grew up in was total 
totally walkable. All of the kids walked in big mobs to all the schools. We had a train running through downtown that took you any place outside you wanted to go. We never ran the arterials through the neighborhoods. The arterials were off the beaten track of the neighborhood, made it really safe for people. So for our downtown Seattle, that's where I'm going to say it's going to be that magical place for us to be able to bike and walk. I have a plan to save the upper deck of the viaduct, retrofit it seismically, and make a park from Pike Market to Pioneer Square, where we can all go out, get the view that we deserve, that's supposed to be the waterfront for all, and I'm going to give it to you. On that viaduct, we can ride our bikes, we can stroll that three quarters of a mile, we can set our chair up and watch the sunset, we can see the mountain. We'll have bike tracks on 2nd Avenue and 4th Avenue so that people can safely move through the bicycles. We'll get rid of some of our parking so that we can have wider streetscapes, the trees can have some room to spread out their roots, and the natural drainage can be installed. I'll make sure that the buses can actually move, not only on 3rd Avenue, but every place else. I'm going to make bus priority lanes so that I'd like to expand that yield to bus law that we have and make people like an emergency vehicle have to get out of the way when the bus is coming. <laughs> because my plan is to have a plan for single occupant vehicles, not a passive aggressive Time. plan, but a spoken plan for how we're going to dial back single occupant vehicles. Thank you. So I haven't been to, uh, but Ed was talking about Amsterdam or Barcelona or Dublin, but I've been to Portland. <laughs> I'll tell you, they're doing a few things right there if they focus on uh, transportation integration. And I didn't get the chance to see my other colleagues answer on the pedestrian master plan, but people talk about solving it in seven, eight, nine years. That's an $840 million proposition. That's why I said 25 years. In addition to the $1.8 billion of backlog we have in transportation projects, where is that money going to come from? Okay, so what I did with City Light as an example, we had two of the toughest years they had, they've had in the history, and we drove about $90 million out of on and capital in their toughest years. If you do that, I think many of you know my background as an attorney, and I know financial policies very well, and I know how to look at organizations and drive efficiencies and prioritize them. And that's, I think, what we're, what we're lacking. So one thing uh, Portland has done, I've looked at a lot of the, the cost studies that they've done in their projects, they have driven a lot of their costs down and they worked on integration. And quite frankly, I think that's what we have to do. So um, what I want to do is, again, keep the good bond rating uh, this city has, but again, look at the actual money that we're spending toward projects. I'm a proven commodity in doing this kind of work, and quite frankly, I'd love to get the master plan done in seven, eight years. I just don't think that's a realistic uh, proposition. You know, but I do think, that's why I specifically talk about the vehicle license fee, because I do think we can sell a good financing package to get us on track, and we're not on track at the current, at the current rate. Thank you very much. Thank you. Has anyone forgot? I think the question was, which cities inspire you most for walkable, walkability, livability, et cetera? I've been a student of cities all over the world for several decades now. I've, I've lived in other places, I've worked, I've studied, I've researched at Harvard, uh, urban sustainability focus in the United States particularly. I've traveled places like Istanbul, London, Copenhagen and cities in the United States. I'm going to choose cities in the U.S. because that's our world here. We can learn best practices from elsewhere, but accomplishing them here is another challenge. The, the three cities that I most uh, have enjoyed and looked to, I would say, would be New York City, which has gone incredibly green over the last decade or so, and is highly walkable, but of course it is extremely ser well served by transit and non-SO, non-single occupant vehicle means. Uh, but parks, open space, bike lanes, uh, all kinds of things that uh, have neighborhoods. My God, they've got great neighborhoods. And so San Francisco is another city that I particularly admire, very dense, one of the densest cities in the country, but also very expensive. But it didn't just happen all at once, it evolved, and it is compact, and it is uh, walkable, bikeable, livable, except for some of the hills, <laughs> pretty steep, and I've biked all over these places I'm mentioning. Cambridge, Mass, twice the density of Seattle, smaller city, about the size of Bellevue, 
But one of the most walkable cities I've been to, and it's because of the scale, because of the uh, independent shops, services, complete neighborhoods, which I'm advocating Time. for. And finally, I'll just say, um, we could do much better. We can learn from these other cities. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks. When I was uh, visiting in Japan, I loved seeing these big bike corrals near the transit stations. Huge amounts of people bike to transit. And I was thinking about that. Wouldn't it be great with that bike head bridge that we're working for to get to Northgate? If you could have tons of people biking to Northgate, fast ride downtown, be a fabulous alternative. I'd love to see that around more. Speaking of transit, big cities have multiple layers of transit. They don't just have one system. They have a regional system and they have a local system. I'd love to see Seattle. Um, you know, have neighborhood to neighborhood rail as well as connecting to the regional rail system. And we're working on that right now with our transit master plan as well as jointly planning with Sound Transit to get to Ballard and to look at studies for U District to Ballard, downtown to West Seattle to get Sound Transit 3 to Ballard by 2016. But we could do more with our own money to help connect our neighborhoods together um, on top of what Sound Transit will do. Cycle tracks, I've not been to Amsterdam or Europe or seen them, I've heard about them though. And we have our first uh, full cycle track up on Linden Avenue North. Amazon, as part of their mitigation, will build a cycle track on 7th. And our bike master plan will have a cycle track network through downtown. So that's a lane separated from pets and cars just for the bicycles. And greenways are great, but in the congested areas, you really have, there's no alternative side street. You have to use the main street. Finally, on our commercial streets, I love seeing additions of things like street cafes in San Francisco with the parklets, where you take a parking space and turn it into a little park. We're going to be rolling a lot of those things out soon in the next year. Thank you. We can't bike our way to power. The capitalist class is not going to get on a bike and ride out of our face in our lives. I'd like to offer the example of revolutionary Cuba and Havana. This isn't a perfect society. But this is a place where the working class took power in 1959. And because of that, talk about policies, rents by law can be no more than 10% of your income. Imagine what this would mean for your life if that were the case. Now, they need a lot more housing. But putting policies like that in place give the working class a chance. Where there's a family neighborhood doctor system, where a family doctor knows your family's history of diabetes or whatever it is and intervenes early rather than after you're in a crisis or need amputations. Where there's education, free, not depending on your parents' income, but because it raises the level of culture for humanity and it's an investment in the future that people have available the greatest works of literature at a young age. These are things that you can't implement in Seattle. These are things that can only be implemented after a revolution is made because it has to do with which class is in power and whose interests are being put forth. But on the way to taking power, there's a lot of gains that we can make and we can fight for. And that's what I urge people to do. I also urge you to read about Cuba for yourself in The Militant and why Cuba punishing why the U.S. punishing Cuba for the revolution Time. has five Cuban revolutionaries in jail. Thank you very much. Uh, uh, fortunately, uh, this weekend, um, the Portland community uh, artist rep honored my wife and I on a, a funding mechanism that we've um, developed for the arts, where the average person gives to the arts. So we were in Portland all weekend. And I will tell you, as Bruce said, they have an integrated system that certainly works. And we used it continually. We walked. We rode what their counterpart is to the South Lake Union Transit. Um, it was wonderful. The city is alive and well. We were not stopped. We did not feel unsafe, nor were we not stopped by any particular individual requesting money. And we walked a lot through that city. Seattle can do this too. We used to be that leader that Portland looked to. So let's use best practices, integrate our system, take the best of what Portland has, but we aren't Portland, we are Seattle. We're not Copenhagen, we're not Amsterdam. We have a unique system 
and we can make it work here. We're this close to getting there. And what's sitting in this room is indicative of how close we are. Thank you. So for our closing statements, we are down to less than 10 minutes. So we're going to ask that you do a closing statement in 30 seconds. So if you can, just say a few things that maybe you got left out. Is the crowd willing to stay? Yes. All right. All right. The crowd is willing. We are fine. So one minute. Uh, closing statement. Um, and Ed, would you mind starting? Again, thank you for this opportunity this evening. You know, it's an exciting time. When the, the Greenways movement is a sign of where Seattle's going to be. Uh, we've moved backwards these last several years in almost every area of our transportation system. It's time to move forward. This is a city that wants to build partnerships and move forward. This is a city that wants to build uh, those walkable communities. This is a city that wants to almost reinvent the dream that the Olmsteads had when they created a a park and boulevard system together. That's what we want to do in this city. And I believe that we can do, and I think you need a leader who has the patience to do that. Yes, I've lost on transportation before I've won. Yes, I've lost on civil rights before I've won. But I've two, done two things. One is I've developed a strategy, I've been patient, and I've built partnerships. And that's how we're going to be able to build that those greenways, that transportation system, that allows us to do something else besides just drive our car. Thank you again for this opportunity this evening. Thank you. I lived in Vancouver, BC for five years, and we are surrounded on both sides with Vancouver that's done transformative things with their bicycle infrastructure, and Portland, obviously. And here, we have Cheryl's on the road, and I was overjoyed as a cyclist when, when those appeared, but then, I just realized how superficial they are, and that harkens back to the Switzerland experience where they have people living in cities where they've lived for generation after generation after generation, and they consider, especially the west coast of America, to be pretty superficial, and our Cheryl's are about that. We Just this week, I'm sure a lot of you heard about the Rutgers expert who was here talking about the death-defying experience on 2nd Avenue downtown. I almost hit a cyclist myself down there, and I'm more aware of that than, than a lot of people, and I felt horrible, and our city has been set up to lead people into these stressful situations, almost, you know, pitting each other, fellow travelers against each other, when we really all just want to get where we're going as fast as we can and as easily as we can. Multimodal, we, we switch around from one day to the next within the day, I might be the only candidate that's hitchhiked to a time. Oh. <laughs> time. Thank you. I think the message I'd like to leave with is that we are all in this together. When we categorize certain groups, the bicycle group, demonize the drivers or the pedestrians, we all lose. And the leader, one of us, sitting up here today, needs to bring all of us together. We need to break those silos. We need to see other perspectives. We just can't walk into a room and say, this is what I want for the bicyclists. This is what I want for uh, pedestrians. We have to have an integrated system, and it will take all of us, and again, one leader to bring us together. One leader to point out that the other person has a perspective. That will be the beginning of the master plan that will work for Seattle. Thank you. There's two Seattle's. There's Seattle of the wealthy property owners, business owners, and bondholders. And there's the Seattle of the working class, whether we're working or unemployed right now. The Socialist Workers' Party defends the working class. And everything that we're presenting adds up to a fight for the resources and the wealth that we create, but we don't get to decide how it's used. Our campaign urges people to read and study our history, women in Cuba, the making of a revolution within the revolution, Malcolm X, black liberation, the road to workers' power, the militant newspaper. We're presenting a program to defend the working class. I urge you to support this campaign there's two other socialist candidates, Evelyn Fruit for city council and John Nobert for court commissioner. 
and they're going all the way to the November election because they're in a field of two. Consider this program and support it. Also, read the Militant newspaper for more coverage on all these fights. Thank you. Thank you. You know, as a, a neighborhood leader, as a Sierra Club member, um, as a running a nonprofit, I worked, I advocated for walking, biking, and transit for it to be a priority. And I can report to you that you hear the same thing from elected officials and politicians that you heard up here today. Everybody's for walking and biking and transit until it's time to really make it a priority in terms of funding or, or policy choices. And I've stood up for it. You can, you can check my record, you can review my record, both as an advocate and as a mayor. And I've taken some heat for that, for standing up for that and doing that. And there's a reason for it. It, it really matters. By the way, you can check the record of other folks too when the state said, we don't get sound transit unless you build eight billion in new highways, I was pretty much alone with the Sierra Club and the Cascade, Cascade Bike Club. We stood up and said no against the entire establishment because we didn't want, it was bad for global warming. It made it worse. That motivates me. I want to be able to tell my kids we did something about global warming. I don't want to say to them, all the politicians collaborated to build more highways. Thank you. Thank you. I have a confession. I am not a lycra dawning commute maniac on bike. <laughs> I do like to ride by a bicycle, but I am I'm one of those willing but wary people, and I think I represent thousands, if not tens of thousands of people who would like to see our city streets made safer. That is why my number one priority is pedestrian bike safety on our streets. It is not safe today, and we're not getting there fast enough in terms of safety. So that's my top priority, is safety on the streets. Second one is urban mobility, all modes. Most of us, excuse me, do travel through all modes. We walk, we bike if we can, and if, we, if it works for us, we take transit, we take light rail, and yes, we drive. I think something like 70% of us of our households have cars, most people drive. Our city's urban form evolved around the automobile. We are in a time of transition. We are expecting 150,000 more people for our city to grow by in the next 15 years. 200,000 more workers, and today two-thirds of those workers live outside Seattle. Time. That spells congestion. We need complete neighborhoods to accommodate Time's that. Time's up. Thank you. My name is Bruce Harry, and thanks for your patience. Uh, you know, I've been in almost every neighborhood in this city, irrespective of the demographic. And I'm fully convinced we all want the same thing. Safe neighborhoods, opportunity for our children, um, livability, walkability. And I think all of us want the same thing. You know, walkable, great greenways, protected bike trails. We want all that, but we don't have the tools. We don't have the skill set. That is our problem. The reason why the mayor will not be able to accomplish the funding of the pedestrian master plan that I say costs $184 million is because he doesn't have a plan. I know, because I'm vice chair of the Transportation Committee, and I sit on the Puget Sound Regional Council Executive Board and other various thoroughly at all of our financing plans. I have a background in business, but I've been fighting for social justice all of my life. And so I'm asking this city to imagine what can happen if we have that kind of leader. I don't care how I'm known after I'm dead, but I hope I inspire a few people, inspire Seattle to be better. That's what my candidacy is about. I ask for your support. I ask for your, uh, your money sometime, too. <laughs> <laughs> I ask you. Yeah, I know. So she, she can ask for a check if I get it to the bunch. <laughs> So I'm Kate Martin. I'm bringing forward 25 years of planning and design experience, over two decades as an activist, and 22 years of parenting down to City Hall. And I assure you, disjointed incrementalism is over. I'm going to make plans that are comprehensive and budgets to go with them and timelines. We can get it done if we have a plan. So when our mayor says how hard the budget is to squeeze this out, and he allocates one block of sidewalks per district, district, per year, that 400 to 1,000 year plan, I say no. That same mayor 
is spending $40 million a year on overtime at police and fire. That adds up to almost a half a billion dollars every 10 years, and I assure you, we can build a lot with that. Thank you so much. I appreciate your support, your vote, and a little check. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. So thank you, thank you everybody for coming. Um, it's a lot of fun. Make sure that you go and vote. And I believe you can register in the back there. Um, and we are just barely over time. So thank you all the candidates.